All right, let's get started. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining this educational webinar on the topic of mixed gain. Now, we've been asked by firefighters that have demoed either of our cameras, the TAC Pro or Fire Pro X, why they don't freeze and switch gain modes, also known as sensitivity modes. The real answer is, is, is pretty detailed and Andy's gonna get into that a little bit later, but the answer relies in, in how the sensor technology was originally designed that gives us an advantage in fire applications. So with a Seek sensor, individual pixels can instantly switch between high gain and low gain mode, which means in its simplest terms, we can render a scene with high heat in the ceiling, sending those pixels into low sensitivity, and still retain excellent detail in the floor with those pixels going to high sensitivity. We can do that all without freezing and switching modes. And this is a complex topic, which is why we've got Mr. Andy Starnes, uh, expert trainer in, in thermal imaging of insight training to explain how it all works and what it means for the fire service. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Andy. Thank you. All right, thank you. You can hear me okay, Brent? Yes, sir. All right. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate you guys and gals allowing us to talk to you today. Uh, as Brent says, I'm very passionate about thermal imaging. I've been involved in this for quite some time now. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to bore you with my bio because you're not here to learn about me. But just notice the little girl in the picture because that's my world, my faith, my family, and the fire department in that order. I tend to mess that up. So uh, I want you to know my background with this device. I was involved from the very beginning, from the drawing to the final design. I was very blessed to be a part of that and being part of that team that did all that work. I was the guy who was basically saying yes or no, that works for firefighters. And I have now have almost 370 hours of burn time with the device, so I can tell you what it will and won't do. Uh, I stay, stay camera non-denominational. I will tell you I got three that I really like, but none of them are perfect. And I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and all the pros and cons of the cameras we go through it. But mainly what we're going to share with you today is why mixed game mode sets this camera apart, something I haven't seen before or thoroughly understood until I got involved with this and how it helps firefighters. So we're gonna break that down and talk about what we're here to learn. So we're gonna talk about current, and I put quote around that for a reason, fire service thermal imaging technology. Uh, we're gonna talk about something that has confused firefighters and still confuses firefighters, which is called temperature modes. Brent mentioned it, call it basically high or low gain. NFPA calls it high or low sensitivity. Those of you who are familiar with it know that when its camera switches to low sensitivity, a green arrow or triangle shows up in the upper left-hand corner inside a green box, indicating the presence of high heat and the camera switch to low sensitivity, meaning low sensitivity to detail. I'm not a big fan of those words because it's counterintuitive to firefighters. They think high, they think high heat, and they think low, they think low heat, and it's the exact opposite, it's the inverse. So just remember this, if you're using a standard camera, if you see the triangle, the arrow pointing up, your butt needs to get down because you're seeing a lot of heat. And we'll talk more in depth about that. Uh, we're gonna talk specifically at about halfway through the program and on about the mixed gain mode and how that works in this device and why it's an advantage to you as a firefighter. So it's an educational webinar for you to understand the entire process of how the camera sees infrared energy, how it processes it and what that means for you. First, let's address some myths. Certain ticks have zero lag or delay. Every camera will freeze, lag, or delay in some way, shape, or form due to what we do to it. What you will learn about this particular device is it lags a lot less, doesn't cause the freezing you see in a lot of cameras, but it's very fluid and very smooth compared to other models. You can make any camera out there freeze based on end user behavior. The majority of the problems I've found with fire service ticks have had to do with the person holding it, such as this next one. Oh, my camera whites out. If you don't know this, you need to pass it along. Firefighters continue to tell me their camera whites out, and then I asked them what they were doing, and I asked them if they wiped the lens, not the screen, the front of the camera when that occurred. And 99% of them said no, they didn't know to do that. Make sure if you're using this device in a nasty environment, which is where we work, Every time you wipe your face piece, you need to wipe the front of that lens periodically or it will build up moisture or particulate. It doesn't matter what camera you're using, the image will degrade or wash out and see a gray screen or white screen. All ticks are slow. 
This is partially true. Anything less than 25 hertz can cause some issues with firefighters and delay in receiving information due to refresh rate. However, this is also due to firefighters scanning way too fast. I've seen firefighters moving that thing around like a lightsaber and expecting them to process that information. I don't think an F-22 pilot could process the information as fast as I've seen some tick scans done because of our end user behavior. And the most important one that I hear all the time is, well, I didn't see the tick, or I didn't see the victim with the tick. Tick must be garbage. That's not the case. If you look at the environment victims are found, the body temperatures, how they're found, and the tick itself, those are the three variables that you can't control. Is it a hot environment with a cold victim? Is it a hot environment with a dead victim who's not circulating body temperature anymore? And what kind of cameras? Is it a situational awareness camera, a decision-making camera? Was it in high or low sensitivity? Did you wipe the lens? Were you standing up? All that stuff's not accounted for. So stop blaming the device when you're not doing a fundamental search because a tick does not replace a hands-on, boots on the ground, searching the room. The tick is designed to give you orientation and deep data that you don't typically have so you can get to the victim faster. So let's start taking some accountability on it and stop blaming devices, which is what we're really good at. We'll blame a nozzle, we'll blame a truck, but we won't blame ourselves. Uh, let's talk about current technology. These are some current models that are out there today. I'm not here to talk about any other model in any negative fashion, because I like thermal imaging cameras in general, and I think they all have value as long as they're in well-trained hands and educated hands. Some of these models are older than others. If you look at this and you have one of these models, you need to think about what that technology looks like back in 2013 versus what it looks like today. Because I, I doubt many of you are still using a 2013 iPhone. There may be a few of you. I saw somebody with an iPhone 6 recently in California. I was impressed. Um, so there's some of you out there, there are some technology holdouts, but make sure if you're gonna stay in the game and you're gonna do the things that we swore to do, that we always update everything else from our turnout gear to our fire trucks. We need to update our technology. And it's gonna to come to a point where you're gonna find it won't work unless you do. And you'll see that today in today's webinar and why that's important. So what are some of those tick improvements we've seen? We've come a long way from the Carnes Iris to the FLIR fire to some of the other things you've seen that were mounted on helmets that look like cinder blocks and look like white blobs on a screen. Now we have camera manufacturers that offer everything from image enhancement to specialized application modes or color palettes, hotspot, cold spot tracker, to edge detection. There's even a camera company now working on something with AI. Uh, the pixel pitch in cameras has improved dramatically from these big, large pixels. They've gotten smaller down to as far as eight micron in some military grade detectors. And we're seeing lower thermal sensitivity, which is the ability of a, of, of a camera to detect objects of similar temperature or the differences in those objects side by side. So we're seeing as low as 30 millikelvin. A millikelvin is a thousandth of a degree. And the new, new advancement we're seeing is brought to us by Seek Thermal called Mixed Gain Mode, which simplifies our process when we're working in a challenging, fast-paced environment where we can't, we can't change or control a lot of the variables. We're gonna talk in depth on how that makes your world easier. However, this is my personal opinion. You can take it for what it's worth. In my opinion, innovation has been lacking. Firefighters have been given breadcrumbs or gifts to them saying, look at this, look at all, all the bells and whistles, look at, the, look at all the color palettes and all this, and the technology inside of that camera hasn't improved much when you talk about the actual pixels themselves. We've had 320 by 240 resolution cameras now for almost 15 to 16 years. They've improved the clarity within those but in many cases, they're still selling low resolution cameras and labeling them as innovative and handing them to firefighters and oh, look how cool this is. No, it's not. You wouldn't give me a 1989 TV or cell phone and tell me how innovative it is. We need to move forward with that. In my 13 years of doing thermal imaging training, I have struggled with the fact that most fire service thermal imaging cameras have performed poorly when you make entry remote from the fire. Not on top of the fire, not in moderate heat, but when you're in low to, you know, 200 to 300 plus degrees uniform temperatures where you can't see a whole lot, I've heard more firefighters complain, and myself included, with cameras not providing good detail. That's why I wanted to be involved in this project. That's why I was so passionate about it and why I am so impressed with what they have done with this device and how it works in that environment. Uh, you will see that some cameras out there perform well 
in high heat and some in low heat. Basically, they work well in either high sensitivity or low sensitivity, but they don't work well in both. The first rule I learned in thermography training was no fire service camera or infrared camera can see all temperature ranges at once. It adjusts by basically doing like your eye does from dilated to constricted. It creates different spans or temperature ranges to measure within that to make it better. If your firefighter thinks span of control, you know, three to seven, optimal being five, we want to keep a smaller span so we can get a better image clarity. But my problem has been many of them work well in one range, but not the other, which basically kind of limits firefighters. And it's not, it's not been something I've been happy with. We've had to overcome that and talk about how you can force a camera into high sensitivity or you want to raise the heat so you can see better, which is not something you want to do in a fire. So that's been frustrating. And it's very difficult to teach that concept known as high and low sensitivity to firefighters, as I mentioned in the beginning. I, I'm an avid reader. I don't read uh, novels and fiction books. I do like science fiction. I watch a lot of Star Wars and Mandalorian stuff with my daughter. But my reading consists of research, thermal imaging stuff, science-based, anything to do with firefighter behavior or fire behavior. And I read this a long time ago and I reread it on a regular basis because in order for us to have the answers to our future, we need to study our past. And this was a thermal imaging research workshop or needs assessment that was done in 2005. And this was a amazing top-notch group of leaders that came together and they discussed what needed to be done in regards to thermal imaging for firefighters. And what they, they asked the following questions, what advances are needed? What are the research needs? What performance metrics are needed? And how do they differ from current methods, right? And what standards are needed, right? So this is the thing that blew my mind is they, they produced a solid set of answers for the most part back then. And only a few of those have been actually followed. So we got NFPA 1801, which is a phenomenal document that talks about how a thermal imaging camera should be designed, tested, built, and basically interoperability, durability, resolution, uh, you know, electronic magnetic immunities, all in there. It's a very in-depth, well put together document. But one of the things they talked about was this, the need for a low cost, high resolution, and hear me when I say this, simple to operate thermal imagery. Why in the world do we want more complicated devices in a high stress environment? This is a direct quote from this report. Keep in mind, this is from 2005. The stress of a fire event also dictates the need to keep the operation of the imager as simple as possible. Most imagers feature fully automated gain and focus settings. They knew that then, sometimes offering no more controls than a large on and off button that can easily be accessed by a firefighter wearing heavy gloves. Think about that. Now pick up any device out there and ask yourself, why does it have nine application modes? Why are the buttons not operate easily operated by a gloved hand? Why do I have to go right, left, right, left, right to turn this device off? Why do I have to flip this switch, hold this press button, hold long press, multi-press? In a high stress environment, when your heart rate's over 170 and condition black, you're not gonna be able to do that. That's why I was so thankful that this device, the buttons are simple, it's on off and a flashlight. There is no, dial it up, dial it down, change this, adjust that. Because in a high stress life and death environment, you don't have time to press buttons. Michael Whitty said in his research paper, a fire service tick should have two application modes, fire and investigative. And I couldn't agree more. One is when you have seconds, one is when you have minutes to actually press buttons. So think about that as we go through this, how can you simplify your job and the challenges you face and 68% of America's functioning in combination or volunteer departments, which means less staffing and I gotta do more. So do I want more complicated buttons to do that? This is the overview of this device. I highlighted some things that are really important. Uh, if you want to go and learn more about it, there's a QR code at the top. You can take out your cell phone, hit that. It takes you to that link at the bottom on their website. Uh, you'll learn more about it, but you also see a bunch of videos we have done. Uh, I think there's 14 educational free videos on this device for you to further your knowledge. And they are in thermal imaging uh, general concepts. They do focus on mixed gain mode and a couple of them too. But this camera has a six hour battery life. I, one of the things I've been frustrated with is two hour battery life because it's two hours on paper, not in practice. Because once you start to put it in a fire, what do lithium ion batteries hate? Heat. You start heating things up, the performance degrades. Plus firefighters don't take care of batteries 
and caused more issues with batteries than I've seen anything else. Um, me, myself included, some of you know my testimony about causing a battery failure, which caused me to be complacent and miss a victim. I share that in every class. This camera has the widest field of view on the market. That's important because we want to see the bad things before they get us. And we want to be able to see that live fire and layout that we talk about so much. And that's really hard to do with just a flashlight. Uh, the resolution quality meets what most decision making cameras have to meet, which is 320 by 240. But where this camera sets itself apart is instead of doing high and low sensitivity or high or low gain, if you're a thermographer or thermologist, it is mixed gain mode. And that is a game changer because now, instead of the entire field of view having to switch to one or the other, high or low gain based on the heat in front of it, as Brent said, each pixel operates independently. Think of it, ladies and gentlemen, that's like having 76,800 freelancers running around going, I will be cold. I will be hot. I will adjust and give you a better picture. I don't care what the chief says. I'm going to give you a better picture over here. Now, we all understand freelancing is a bad thing on the fire ground, but in this case, it's phenomenal because now this pixel can be just hot enough to show color, while this one can stay in grayscale, giving you better contrast, image clarity, without a loss of detail. That's why it matters. But if you were in our last webinar, you will understand that this is a decision-making tick, and I talked about the criteria for that. So what we did is put a couple slides in here for you to refer to because I want firefighters to go back after this webinar and go, number one, am I using a decision-making tick or am I using a situational awareness tick? Number two, is mine outdated? Do I need to upgrade and get our department up to the you know 2020s level, right? And I need to understand these key attributes that we list here, field of view, temperature modes, resolution, image quality, the thermal sensitivity of the camera, refresh rate, and what can the camera detect, not outside in ambient temperatures, but in a fire? The military calls it detect, recognize, identify. I put my top three favorite pictures on this screen because they're all high resolution images. You got the Attack Pro, the Bullard uh, QXT or NXT, or the FLIR K53 through the 65. All great cameras. They all have good image quality, but those meet those standards. And I want you to see that. Uh, and if you didn't get to attend that webinar or you missed it, guess what? Bonus, check out the QR code right here. If you scan that, it'll take you to a link that will allow you to rewatch that webinar. And hopefully if you missed that, it'll help you understand the things we're gonna talk about here and tells you why these things are important and why you should do training with heat sources. Hear me when I say this, if you are buying cameras and you are not using a significant heat source when you're training with them, you are doing your firefighters a disservice. You will buy a camera and be extremely disappointed because you won't know how it will behave until you put it in adverse conditions. And that's what it's designed to do. So if a manufacturer will not let you test their device in a fire, you tell them have a nice day because you wouldn't buy a car unless you test drive it. So you notice that QR code there, it says free webinar link. That's right, free thanks to Seek Thermal. You can view that. It's me talking, but you get all the slides and everything in it. You can use it for Monday night training. It's basically defining the difference of those two cameras, situational awareness and decision making, and why that's important to firefighters. So let's talk about the Attack Pro mixed gain mode and why that makes a difference for you. Here's where the rubber meets the road. This camera has the widest field on the, view to, on the market. However, mixed gain mode is what sets it apart because no other manufacturer does this. I put an asterisk there because Seek actually makes the core for uh, the iTIC and also the Scott D320 and the MSA Lunar. So if you're using those devices, you'll notice that no triangle shows up in the upper left-hand corner when that camera's going from high to low sensitivity because the pixels are switching independently. The thing that most firefighters have trouble with is this is a 25 hertz camera and it's responding faster than 60 hertz models. The reason is each pixel switching independently. When we break this down, you'll realize that all the other models have to have a certain percentage of the pixels to meet a certain temperature range before it allows it to switch. In other, way, other words, it's like going to an amusement park and it says, this you gotta be this tall to ride. And until you reach that height, you don't get to ride that ride. So until you reach that percentage of pixels and heat, you don't get to go to low sensitivity. You don't switch. And guess what? The manufacturer gets to choose when that occurs. Do you think that's a great idea? Because they all vary. Early colorization shows up in this camera, even if you put two other cameras on the market that I know of right now that show color at 302 degrees, 
This one will show colorization earlier because the pixel will switch instead of having the entire field of view having to switch to engage that. So that gives you earlier warning, better situational awareness, faster, quicker, and here's where it really hits me. When I look at, these are my cameras. I have all these cameras with me and more. I think I own 55 cameras now. The better grayscale imagery in this camera is phenomenal in the cooler regions. Think of that about that when you enter a fire environment. If I start my scan low like I'm supposed to, because if you start your scan high, you shall die because you're going to miss things. They say light fire and layout, and you stick the camera in the heat. You're not crawling across the ceiling. Point it where the victims are. Check out the lower, cooler areas, and the camera will give you better image clarity. Also, this camera shows convection currents phenomenal. It's almost, I'd say Bullard and Attack Pro are side by side. Bullard's got really good convection currents and high sensitivity. The Attack Pro give them a run for their money on that one. Six hour battery life, ease of operation ergonomics is pistol grip, fits in a gloved hand, a small hand, big hand, doesn't matter. We tested that. The buttons are operated with a gloved hand on, no problem. It's basically budget friendly for every fire department out there and it has a five year warranty on it, which if you know firefighters, we'll tear something up. So I highly recommend whatever you get, make sure you have a warranty because you're looking at my van right there and my boys are not nice to things. I have five cameras sitting over here that got to go back to the shop and it ain't warranty based. It's cause we scratched the lenses and tore them up or we let a student hold one, not pay attention. It got pointed at the sun and burnt the detector up. Uh, don't do that. So this camera does something that most don't. When you rotate this camera in a pistol grip format, you'll notice that when you go from pistol grip to what we call gangster grip, I can easily pick up the floor, but I want you to notice that there was no lag when I did that. And I went from a heat signature on the left to no heat signature within the field of view. And I quickly picked up a hose line. Think if you're lost or disoriented and think about this. If you're trying to speed up your efficiency on the fire ground, right here with this type of view, I can see the floor and the ceiling in one shot. So if I scan left to right in the gangster grip in a residential context, this camera will allow me to see from a zero to a 10 foot ceiling in that one view. I'm talking about left to right and I'll come back across the ceiling towards the door to make sure I didn't have a vaulted ceiling and I look at those convection currents before I make entry. That takes a 20 second scan down to about 10 or less. That's where we're moving forward instead of staring at a TV and, and you know where you, you get a lot of complaints about firefighters saying, well, they're just staring at the tick too much. I agree. They need to be a proficient at it, but they also need to know how this can help them do that. And you may see a lot of cameras out there that claim 320 by 240 resolution. Just because they have the same resolution don't mean they have the same performance. You can buy a V6 in one car and a V6 in another. And that other V6 outperforms it. May have a twin turbo, may be built differently. And what you'll find when you start looking at these devices in a live fire environment, not in a day room, you will see that they perform differently due to their programming and their software that they're using by the manufacturer. Mixed gain mode is the reason that this one performs even better than most because you can see that firefighter. You can see the detail of his SCBA and his fellow firefighter in the background while still seeing the fire in the upper, upper area, superheated area. So this allows us to see a small child's hand at 15 feet with this level of resolution. And that's an NFPA standard. You can read about it in NFPA 1801. But this camera, side by side with other models at the same price point, claiming the same resolution, it outperforms them bar none. And you don't have to believe me. I'm going to give you an opportunity to put it to test at the end of this webinar. And this is why I want you to understand numbers don't always equate, equate to performance. Because this camera on the left has 110,000 pixels, roughly. And it's still for sale in the market, but it was made in 2014. There's a $600 situational awareness camera with almost the same better image quality or better made in 2018. So why is that one not better? Where has technology gone from 2014 to now? What is the pixel pitch? What is the software? How are they doing that differently now than they were then? Make sure you're staying up to date with your cameras and you're using current technology to fight a current modern enemy and go and rescue the people that we swore to protect. This device does something that will help you in that respect better than others. It outlines or keeps that lower area in focus, as Brent says, even when the, you have a presence of high heat. Whether it's low heat, moderate heat, or high heat, I'm still able to see that floor area 
with this device, you can see that thermal layer with one of my guys sitting in this container and a, a mannequin in the lower left still in focus. Now you're not going to do that with the majority of cameras out there. I'd say FLIR and this one are going to give you the best image quality in high heat, where Bullard's not going to do that in high heat. Bullard's going to give you better image detail in low heat. So they all have their pros and cons, but where this one basically becomes a tactically advantage for the firefighter is I don't have to worry about whether I'm in high or low gain or high or low sensitivity. I simply have to point the camera where I need to see and interpret the image. That's what I need to do. I don't need to have an analysis class when I'm in the fire. And that all comes down to what this whole webinar is about, which is understanding the fancy words, temperature modes. If you're a thermologist, it's called high or low gain. If you are in the fire service, it's called high or low sensitivity. So this is a brief history of all that in one slide. There are cameras out there today that are single gain. In other words, they are a one-way street. They max out at a certain temperature and they don't switch to low sensitivity or low gain. Those are typically special application modes. You see that in the FLIR and the search and rescue mode option, the survey mode in the uh, Seek Fire Pro X. You see thermal scan, the Draeger, overhaul mode in the Argus. Usually when that occurs, you have to be, there's a little symbol that shows up required by NFPA that tells you you are in a plus mode, which is something outside of TI Basic. TI Basic is the standard basic color palette that NFPA wants firefighters to use. Every camera is required to start in that. And if the camera is equipped with a dual gain, low sensitivity mode, it has to have a low sensitivity indicator. If your camera is from 2012 to 2023, when that occurs, a green triangle or arrow will show up in the upper left-hand corner with this box indicating you're in the presence of high heat, and the camera's gonna be in low sensitivity detail. If you have a camera, sadly, from 1999 to 2010, you may see any of the following. If you have an MSA 5000 or 5200, 5600 or 5800, when it switches to low sensitivity, the bar on the right that was green will now switch to blue and you will see a blue L that is very hard to see in the lower left-hand corner. If you're using an older Bullard or an older Scott, it'll say EI in the upper left-hand corner. That's not EI, EIO, that's hot. That's electronic integration, meaning it is in low sensitivity. The Scott Eagle attack would say hot, basically. So that's pretty neat, hot, I get that. And then there's cameras that had tri gain, which is very difficult to understand. It had high, medium, and low sensitivity, high, low, and extended low. You see that in the Leader or Tempest camera. You see that in the Argus camera. You saw that in the Scott X380. Those are the ones that I'm, I'm aware of. And then you have the new player in the game, which is the Seek Mixed Game Mode. There is no indicator taking up valuable real estate on your screen. Because I want you to look at all these symbols for a minute and think about a three by four inch screen and what these symbols could cover up. If I have lots of letters and icons, what could you miss if that's all on that screen? Think about that. So let's talk about some, some similarities between us and our device. If you are in a dark room and you step out in the bright light, your eye has to react to the light unless you've been to the eye doctor like I was recently and gave those cool eye drops that everybody loves. Your pupil has a high and low sensitivity. So when your pupil is dilated, that is high sensitivity. When it sees light, bright light, it constricts and undergoes a chemical change known as low sensitivity, which makes it difficult or impossible to see objects in the vicinity of that bright light. So if you want a great demonstration of this, sit in the dark across from your buddy and have a flashlight in your hand, but turn off, let your eyes adjust. And when you can start to make out details in the room, turn that bright light on and shove it in his or her face. Now, besides anger, they're gonna see bright light and nothing else because the outside edges of that are gonna be impossible or difficult to see because of the, the eye switching. Your tick does the same thing, but with heat, not light. As overall heat increases, the detail within the image decreases as it loses gain, hence low sensitivity, or basically sensitivity to detail. Uh, one of my instructors came up with a simple analogy. As he said, Andy, it's like putting sunglasses on. And I can't agree more. High sensitivity is no sunglasses. Low sensitivity is sunglasses. So I can still see, I just can't see as well. So let's give you some examples of what that looks like so you can better understand that. This is the Bullard camera, one of my favorites, the QXT or NXT, looking up at high heat, and then we look down at the floor. Watch how the image improves in high sensitivity. And then we go up, the triangle engages, and we see the fire, but we don't see background as well. In high sensitivity, this detail is phenomenal. 
in low sensitivity, it's okay. It's not the best, but man, it's it's still a sharp image, especially the convection currents. You may see that red dot with a green circle around it. That's a recording icon. But notice how fast this camera does that. This camera switches in three tenths of a second. That's pretty impressive. There is a brief flash when it occurs. But if you notice, that is pretty detailed on the floor and high sensitivity. So this camera's advantage is high sensitivity. So everyone has one, right? So if you look at these, this camera, I put these side by side, one of my instructors, you see him in high sensitivity and you see him when he opens the door to the fire room in low sensitivity and notice what happens to him. And I want you to think about that when you're looking for a victim. When things are on the floor, four footing down where it's cooler, what might you miss if you don't understand this concept? I'm not here to sell you a camera. I'm here to tell you that if you don't understand this, you can miss something, you can get hurt, killed, or more importantly, you may go home wondering why you missed a victim or missed your buddy. And that's not good. That means we over relied on a technological device that we didn't fully understand. And this is an example of that. When we're looking up, we see the heat moving left to right from this Bullard camera, which is really good convection currents. You see the triangle showing left to right. But when we go down low, and we get the camera in high sensitivity, look how much better the image becomes. How many firefighters know that? Now you do. So no matter what camera you're using, and whether you buy an Attack Pro or not, you need to understand this affects how you see that environment, okay? And then if you see the FLIR camera, which is one of my other favorites, you can see heat up top and low sensitivity. And when we bring it down, the camera freezes for a second, and then you see no color and it switches to high sensitivity. Now it's not gonna say that. I added the old state PowerPoint cheat sheet words in there for you. But as you go up, you'll see the color engage or the camera will freeze, triangle shows up and then color engages and there's the gangster grip seeing the entire field of view in one shot, which is my personal favorite, right? When you wanna switch it to gangster grip. Now, when you look at this one, you'll actually see the delay that we talk about that occurs in a lot of cameras. You saw the firefighter freeze for a second, then he was like, hmm, he went 10 feet in a flash. He didn't, that's the camera catching up. So firefighters often scan too fast and miss this game change or mode change and don't realize, ooh, that's bad, that's hot. Wow, I should pay attention to that. But if you don't do this type of training where you're able to let them sit there and see the fire progress and watch the camera change and see how it works in high, low, moderate heat, can they see targets? You're, you're putting them at a disservice. If you just stick this on the truck and say, hey guys, look at the camera, turn it on, turn it off, uh, point at the stove, that's not a good idea. They need to be well-trained on this device if they're gonna use it in an ideal H environment. And this is how it affects your ability to see the victim. This is my hand as I move it from the countertop over to the, the gas grill, watch what happens. My hand didn't change temperature, but the background did. And if you notice, when that changed to low sensitivity, my hand almost disappeared. Some old school th thermal imaging instructors called that thermal inversion. It doesn't really invert, it has the appearance of that. My hand didn't change temperature, but the background did. The camera switched to low sensitivity, which will make objects of that temperature and cooler hard to see. Think about that, that standard game changes, that's what's out there today in every camera out there except for the Attack Pro. The Attack Pro uses something called mixed gain mode. So instead of requiring the entire field of view to reach that, you must be this tall to ride, switch to the low sensitivity mark, each pixel switches independently. So it's a higher performance. It's like having little switches operating on their own. It eliminates that lag between high and low sensitivity, which often equates to a loss of detail. And it engages colorization earlier because a few pixels can change color while the other ones stay black, gray, or white, giving you a sharper image and keeping that area down low in focus, which has been unheard of until this point. So here's the strengths and weaknesses of this camera. So you know up front, I've been burning with it since last June. Performs well in low, moderate, and high heat. I can see convection currents well. Fire attack and search can be done with ease. I used to tell people, they said, which camera would you buy? I'd say, none of them. They're like, why? I said, well, if I'm doing size up or fire attack, I'd use a FLIR. If I was doing search, I'd use a bullet. And they're like, why? I said, because I know what they'll do. Now this camera, I can do both without pushing buttons. And it works well in the area that most firefighters are struggling. 
which is that remote entry area from I'm coming in on the A division, I'm working towards the C division. It shows up exceptionally well from 100 to 700 degrees. Display is bright and you will notice that the colors are actually gray. When you see gray down low, a lot of cameras, they're actually a tint of blue. I'll show you that. And it, it, makes, it turns those pixels, switching at 302 degrees to color beginning at yellow earlier than anyone out there while still giving you image clarity down low. That is phenomenal for us. And this is what blew my mind. I said, oh, it's a 25 hertz refresh rate. It's gonna lag compared to 60 hertz. Watch when we go from the floor to the ceiling in Stafford County, Virginia. No lag. Look at the firefighters down low. They're still in focus. You can see the blades of straw on the floor, even in the flashover container. I haven't had a camera that would do that that well. Not at all. And then if you look at the weakness of this camera, it doesn't, it's not a search and rescue camera. It's not for outside ambient temperatures. This is an Indy car that needs to be drove on an Indy track. You're not going to take this outside and play hide and seek with it. And if you turn it on in the day room and expect it to perform, good luck. Fire service thermal imaging cameras are designed to focus and work in high heat environments, 100 degrees and above. It does not have any extra application modes. Some people view that as a con. I view that as a pro because I have had more firefighters get in trouble by pushing buttons under stress and didn't know what mode they were in, especially cameras that offer something called black hot, which is reverse polarity. That used to be against the law, so to speak, per NFPA, but somehow or another that's snuck back into the fire service. Here's where you need to understand about fire service technology and where I think it's headed. The disadvantage of standard gain changes, high and low sensitivity and having to have an indicator, you're basically having to wait until you're close enough. And when the manufacturer says it's met this parameter before it switches and how that will perform varies by the manufacturer. So do you know how that works? And will you recognize that green triangle, the little tiny green triangle in the upper left-hand corner under stress with a dirty screen and moving through a fire environment? My opinion is that delays thermal threat identification. Whereas this colorizes earlier, it's faster, safer, smarter, and my favorite word, it's simple. Firefighter simple. You don't have to have a thermology degree or thermography certification to understand that. And the other thing is, most of those cameras out there, as I said, are optimized to perform better in either one of those gains, high or low gain or high or low sensitivity. None of them could do both. This one can. Now it does have some weaknesses to it, like I said, but when you are in the fire environment, you don't have that trade-off like the other models do. And I want you to think about that for a minute. What does that mean for the firefighter if I have a trade-off in my device? It performs well in low temperatures or high temperatures? What does that mean for you when you're searching for a victim, you're searching for the fire, or more importantly, you become lost or disoriented, which 18% of all fire ground injuries occur from that. If you don't know how it's gonna perform and the image quality stinks in one or the other, you're gonna be in trouble. So I want something simple, smart, fast, and safe. And I want you to see it in action. We actually have one that has a recording option. This is in uh, LA County. We just went and did a train to trainer with them. You can see the convection currents moving across the ceiling. This is our thermal rebound drill where we show a small amount of water is not sufficient to stop heat currents. Notice how quickly that comes back. Look at the floor. Look how clear that is. Did you see any lag or delay when I went from the floor to the ceiling as Chief Lightly is getting to play on the nozzle? By the way, in my company, the chiefs get the nozzle. The other guys get to do search. They don't have a problem with that because I don't ever get to touch it at work. So, But you can clearly see his helmet, the nozzle, the container, the convection currents all in focus. And then when he flows a little bit of water here, watch when he shuts it down, you see it come right back. That's called thermal rebound. We're able to keep the, the lower area in focus. Look at that. You can see, see the bail of the nozzle close. You can see the firefighter crawling toward you. You can see his regulator line coming off that MSA air pack. Uh, you can tell it's an MSA air pack, more importantly for my air pack geeks out there. And you can still see the threat and you can see the reflection on the floor all without having to worry about that switch, that delay that between high and low gain. Now, if you got your phone, I highly recommend you take a picture of this slide. It's not the best slide in the world, but it has profound meaning. If you're using any of these models out here that, that are past the seat from FLIR to Bullard to Leader to MSA, 
not bad cameras, but you need to know this is when they switch from high to low sensitivity or high to low gain. So if I start with the FLIR, which is next to the seat, the most sensitive model out there, 2% of the pixels have to be over 302 degrees Fahrenheit for one, one second of pixel saturation. That means 1,536 pixels have to be at that heat signature and then it'll switch. That camera also has a safety feature built in that if, if you don't have 98% of the pixels below 122 degrees, it will not come out of low sensitivity. So think about that when you're trying to force it and point it back at the floor and make it switch to high sensitivity. Because if it's not cool enough, it's gonna say, uh-uh, still too hot. Bullard requires 3% of the pixels at 230 degrees, which is a lower temperature requirement. That puts you at 2,304 pixels, and Bullard switches at three tenths of a second, which is faster than FLIR. Tempest, or leader, requires 5% of 110,000 pixels, which is 5,509 pixels to do so at their temperature requirement, where MSA requires 32% of their overall pixels before it switches. So that camera will stay in high sensitivity longer than any other camera on the market. If you're a search person, you'll like that. If you're looking for thermal severity, you won't like that. But what does it take for the Attack Pro to switch? One pixel. Each one does it individually. I'm not having to wait. Think about that. I don't wanna wait in a fire. Have you ever met a patient firefighter in a fire environment when somebody's standing in the front yard saying, my kids are in there, my kids are in there. No, we don't have time to wait. I don't have time for Bluetooth to connect. I don't have time for that software to update. I don't have time for a camera that takes 30 seconds to turn on and I forgot to turn it on when I got off the truck. You need to know that speed equates to success if you're skillful, bottom line, and you need something that will do that. So why mixed gain mode? These are two exceptional cameras side by side looking through a little carpet flap we have on our VES uh, Evolution at Firehouse Expo. My guys call this the fun house. The reason it's the fun house is I don't get to go in it. Something about me stopping them from having fun, I don't know. But if you look at these two devices, they're both giving you good image quality, but look at the Attack Pro on the bottom and notice what you're seeing there versus the one on the top. You're seeing early colorization and better grayscale. Why? Because mixed gain mode switches pixel by pixel, whereas the model on the top has to wait till 2% of the pixels are over 302 degrees for one second and has to be within its distance to spot ratio to do so. This, this is why mixed game mode is a game changer. You study leadership, there's something called disruptive leadership. That somebody comes along, has a great idea and really should be embraced, but none of the other people like it. I'm telling you right now, everybody else ain't gonna like this manufacturer wise, but firefighters are. Because this is gonna make it simpler, easier, smarter. And it's me and my friend Chad, we're talking about it, he goes, hey, you can't do that. Uh, that's a part of the class, high and low sensitivity. You're taking out one of my objectives. I said, me too, I've been teaching it for years. But to me, it makes it easier. I wanna make the firefighter's job easier, not harder, not more complicated. And if you look at this video, it was one of the first videos we did with the first model. We put a GoPro on it and we're scanning from the floor to the ceiling in Madison Township, Indiana, which is outside of Notre Dame. Uh, excuse the, the music with it, but you'll see how there isn't much delay at all as I go from top to bottom. And more importantly, there isn't a loss of detail. Notice when I brought the camera back down, there wasn't a freeze, there wasn't a delay. I didn't have to wait on the triangle. It just did it automatically. And here's another example for you. This is filmed recently when our California trip. You look here, you can see my boots. We go back up. This is in Chula Vista, California. Look how detailed the floor is. Still see the heat. I'm not waiting on that delay as it switches. I'm still keeping objects in focus. I'm able to see where they've marked exit on the bottom of the doors there, which shows up in infrared, which is pretty cool. See my boots, I can see the smooth bore nozzle and the heat reflecting off the bail. It's a clear image, simple, easy, fast. I still see the chains in the ceiling, see the convection currents rolling in my head going, hey, you need to back up, dummy. 
that's me, so I can call them dummy. And then the firefighters seeing the heat coming left to right. This is real time without editing the scan because I wanted you to see how fast firefighters move. And that's me doing that. And the camera wasn't choppy or laggy while we were doing it. And then this one is clear as day. You can see we're looking down this container in LA County and you can see the convection currents coming out when the nozzle's closed. And you can see when we shut the nozzle or open the nozzle and see what happens there. Nozzle's open, convection currents stop. Nozzle closed. Comes right back. Forty GPM nozzles stopping convection currents, sitting twenty-five feet away in the watch group, and I'm clearly seeing convection currents, the firefighters, the thermal layer, and I'm seeing that little spot highlight in the ceiling that most cameras would not highlight early in color because this camera uses mixed gain mode. These are all our videos that we've filmed. And this is so you can see it in real time. This is all the other models side by side and what it takes to make them switch. We'll start with this model here. This is the MSA and my friends overseas. It goes from high sensitivity to low. Notice the color went away. See the triangle? Watch it again. There's it, there it happens again. Beautiful convection currents, but I'd like to see color. There's the bullet I showed you, high sen or low sensitivity first. Goes down to the floor here in a minute so you can see a little bit better. You see the victim and then the door and the stair railing. That's in high sensitivity. That camera performs exceptional from zero to 240 degrees. The FLIR going from the floor to the high heat environment, you see the freeze and then you see color engaged. They use something called FSX. Gives you exceptional detail and high heat, but notice there's a delay. So those are your your main models out there, and here's the Attack Pro in Germany. This is German firefighters learning how to search like American firefighters. They love the class because they're not allowed to search unless they have a hose line. And they're moving around freely. I can see them, watch them while the heat is in the background behind them. They had to crawl down here, close the door to the fire room, and work their way back from greatest thermal threat. Don't make fun of their helmets. They're still cool people. So that all comes to these points here about why this camera does what it does. And it shows color just like a FLIR or an Argus starting at 302 degrees, which I'm a personal fake. I like early colorization as a firefighter. But if you're using colorization, make sure your firefighters understand that I have to be able to see it. So 12 million Americans are colorblind. Is one of your people colorblind? Make sure you, they can see the colors. But this camera shows color earlier than any other model because it's pixel by pixel. And here's your color slide that shows that and when it occurs. So instead of waiting until the entire field of view reaches a certain percentage, this pixel shows up 302 degrees, it'll turn yellow. This pixel is at 600, it'll turn orange. This one's at red, it'll, or 800, it'll turn red. While still keeping the firefighter from Long Pope, California here in the, in the bottom right in focus. The majority of cameras out there, that firefighter would disappear or diminish in detail when the camera switched to low sensitivity. That's been the downside of fire service ticks up to this point. And it's been one of the reasons I think firefighters don't like cameras because they don't understand why the camera does that and how it works. And this is the attack pro looking around a room towards the firefighters making entry, real time, no, no editing. Here they come in doing their scan. This is called their go, no go decision making model. Basically, it's a demonstration to teach them to assess the environment. Where's the fire? Where am I going? Where's the layout? Where's the victims? How long can I be in here? How long can a victim make it in here? It's not survivability profiling because we hate that word. It's where's the problem? What can I do to mitigate it? And you can see the hose line clear as day. You can see the convection currents, the thermal layering. I'm going from floor to ceiling because I'm serving as an instructor, so I'm supposed to be watching over them, not, not videotaping. See how detailed my boots are? And then I go right back up to the ceiling, scan around the firefighters, and I can still see them. That's a game changer. That's why this mode is simple, easy, and smarter, okay? And if you're still concerned, because all it's got 25 hertz refresh rate, this is the Attack Pro on the left and another camera that has a 60 hertz refresh rate on the right. Which one's faster? We'll do it again. Attack Pro left. Other camera right. 
I've seen firefighters miss the fire room because of that one and a half second delay. You decide. And when you delay information to a firefighter, you can miss stuff. A friend of mine from MES, Brian Wanstrap, where we were talking about this, and I thought this was profound. I could lose the majority of the room if I started scanning from the cold area and hit a high heat environment and the camera took anywhere between one to three seconds to catch up. I could lose the majority of that room and not even know it because I'm under stress and scanning too fast. So firefighters need to understand how refresh rate and how the camera's programming affects their overall decision-making. If you're relying on that device in that respect, you're in trouble. You need to know what it will do and what it won't do before you do that with it. And then say, well, the camera failed. No, we failed ourselves by not being educated. And then if you look at what NFPA says about these devices, this is what they require symbols or icons wise on the screen, how it shall be laid out, all of that. But I want you to think about if all that is visible, which is usually only visible at startup, how much real estate is that taking up on your screen? Could a child's hand be hidden, a nozzle, a firefighter's extremely, extremity, like a boot sticking out? I've seen that hidden by the triangle, by the plus sign, by the spot temperature, and then depending on how big they make their icons, could block out even more things. If you look at the Attack Pro, you notice there is no spot temperature. You can clearly see the convection currents. The only icons are the battery bars and the relative heat indicator on the right. If you want to turn all that stuff on, so be it. You can push the flashlight button and make this plus sign show up and the spot temperature show back up, which I don't recommend because the spot temperature has been listed as a contributing factor in line of duty desk, that's why it's been removed per NFP 1801 in the new standard. So you need to make sure they're aware of that problem too. And if you're gonna test any fire service camera, please don't turn it on in a 72 degree fire station and go, ah, that sucks, we're not buying that one. No, you don't know what that thing's designed to do. You need to turn it on and test it in low heat, moderate heat, high heat. So test it as I make entry, as I move towards the fire, have some targets for them to identify. Have a hose line in there where they flow across the ceiling and see convection currents versus colorization. See all that, not in a day room. And understand when you turn any fire service camera on, the first few seconds, the camera's actually warming up. So if you see a camera freezing momentarily, any camera out there is doing something called flat field correction, and it's going to do that. So if you wait to turn it on until you get off the fire truck and you say it was freezing on me, that's a problem that you need to understand. You turn it on on the way to the call, not when you step off the truck. So make sure you understand that. And like I said, why is there no spot temperature? This is a direct quote from NFP 1801 that despite all the manufacturer's manual warnings, it says, don't use this to make tactical decisions. It became apparent in three recent NIOSH firefighter fatality investigation reports that there is a lack of understanding on behalf of the fire service features capabilities. I would add too that firefighters misuse that feature and overhaul more than anything else. I've heard it in my own department. Hey chief, we're good, the living room's 72 degrees. I'm like, uh, can we go inside and talk for a minute? I don't chastise them because 15 years ago, I didn't know better either, right? And if you wanna learn more about that topic, I have included resources in almost every five slides so you can do that. This references the Houston line of duty death report that talks about reading the spot temperature Everything that's referenced about the spot temperature being removed and why it should be removed and why you shouldn't rely on it, you scan that QR code, you'll go to our most read article on our blog called The Danger of the Spot Temperature. You don't want to use it as a thermometer. Trust me, it's a qualitative design, device designed to see heat. And if you want to have some fun, you got 20 bucks, buy you a metal trash can and keep the label on it and you can show them. A lot of people tell you, well, I can just boil some water in a shiny pot and do this demonstration. I think this is more fun. So if it's a cool night, you set something on fire, put it in a metal trash can, get the fire going, engage the spot temperature on your camera, point it at the shiny surface, and tell me if you would touch that metal trash can knowing how hot it is. But if you notice we left the label on there, the label is showing color. You move that little reticle, which is that little square in the center, up to that little hot spot, all of a sudden the temperature skyrockets. Why? Then you can go back into fire station and have an interesting conversation about a word called emissivity, which is the most important attribute in temperature measurement, which every fire service camera is not adjustable. It's preset emissivity of 0.95 to 0.97, which is human skin, wood, carbonaceous objects, soot, 
not shiny surfaces. Shiny surfaces reflect more energy than they emit or absorb. Make sure you're aware of that. And if you don't believe anything I've shared with you today, my dad has a simple motto I repeat all the time. We test, we demonstrate, we share, you decide. That's Project Kill the Flashovers model, motto, and here's how you do that. You scan that top QR code for the burn program and Seek Thermal will let you fill out some application information. They'll send you an attack probe so you can burn with it and decide for yourself. Well, when you get it, you need to go to that little link on the bottom and download our free lesson plan on how to test it. So you will have a specification performance-based lesson plan on how to test your top three cameras and see for yourself. Don't believe me, don't believe salesperson. Put it in your firefighter's hands. Go burn with it and then call me because I am not gonna sell you anything. I want you to learn more than anything and the only way we learn, ladies and gentlemen, is through training and education. I hope this information was valuable for you, but I want you to remember this following quote. We are very passionate. And if you wanna be a subject matter expert, you gotta make the subject matter. In 2005, that report I referenced in the beginning said that in a fire service tick was a significant investment, typically in the order of $10,000 per camera. We're in 2023 and those cameras today can cost 3,000, to as much as $9,000. And it said also that most consumers have little guidance on instrument performance beyond manufacturer literature and recommendations from other users. In other words, it was anecdotal information. The only one out there was Safe IR. They were the godfathers of thermal imaging training. I learned a lot from them and my father and killed a flashover. Now you've got a plethora of information you can reach out to. Plus you have our website. We have a private uh, Facebook group called Tactical Thermal Imaging. Go in there, search it. You have to answer two questions to join, but make sure if you're gonna buy a device, when was it made? Is it made last year, three years ago, four years ago? Is it made 10 years ago? And you're gonna pay $9,000 for it. You might wanna do your homework. So how can we help you? Go to our, all of our social media stuff and check us out and see that we post something educational or insightful, pun intended, every single day. I have one of my guys doing social media. I'm doing social media. We post a lot. Every single day, I've been doing that since 2012. Share our posts with others. Look at our resources, our videos, our articles, quick references. Go to Seek Thermal's website, thermal.com, and see the 14 videos. Go to our YouTube channel, 700 videos on there, 380 of them are mine. And if you have questions, email us, text us, or call if you have questions. You want to partner or, or help get some help from us, you can do that. And and if you still think this is not enough, I'm giving you more than anybody else will give you. If you scan this QR code, I know my email is about to blow up, but this is a free Google Drive where it has an Attack Pro resource document with videos, Attack Pro literature, and I update this thing. I leave it open and I put videos in it. So if you want more stuff, text me, email me, and I'll upload it to it. Uh, you know, I paid more for that dreaded word called cloud storage, where you, you, know, you put your money in the cloud, you can't see it. I, I, I hate that but scan it, use it, share it. And they're like, why would a guy give away stuff? Because I want to help you. I don't want to hinder you. People are worried about people stealing their stuff. Sure, I'm sure somebody will take a PowerPoint, whatever, and stand up and say they wrote it. Fine, that's on them. I want you to be better and what we term intelligently aggressive. Keep that in mind and know that we're here to help you. And that's what we do. And uh, this is also all of our social media stuff here, and that is my email address. So scan that, and I'll go back to the QR code for those of you who need it. And Brent, that is all I have. I'll close out with one minute and 10 seconds remaining. Very good. Well, thanks, Andy. I'll just go ahead and, and second some of your final comments. I would encourage all of you, if you have not already followed Andy on social, um, subscribe to his YouTube channel. There is a wealth of free information there. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Seek products, of course, visit thermal.com. Um, if you'd like to request a free burn demo of the Attack Pro, you can find that on the Attack Pro webpage. So really appreciate everyone joining and hope you guys have a good day. Thank you.